for. So for the past eight months, we have all been upended by Corona or COVID-19 or whatever it is called these days. And in the wake of that tremendous amount of angst and even civil unrest in hotspots around the world, we've had just an outpouring of discontent and concern. 2020 has come to symbolize uncertainty and even chaos. But while we were not looking, I guess, quietly, a sea change is occurring in the Middle East. A new day seems to be dawning for Israel and the United Arab Emirates with the so-called Abraham Accords. And actually just today, this very morning, an Israeli delegation has arrived in Bahrain, another country in the Gulf. And they are holding talks on areas of potential cooperation, including investments, civil aviation, tourism. I think by today's day end, the full diplomatic ties are expected to be established between Bahrain and Israel. These developments have caught many by surprise, but I don't think our guest speaker tonight was caught by surprise. He's a businessman and an activist. His life story reads like a movie script and he has had a finger on the pulse of the Arab world for a long time. He's born in Kuwait to Palestinian parents. Mark Halawa, our guest tonight has been quietly at the forefront of the normalizing of relations between Israel and the UAE. Today, this former Muslim is a practicing Jew living in Jerusalem, Israel, and serves at the forefront of the new AU, a, UAE, rather, Israel business nexus. And he joins us tonight to share the, his inside story of UAE and Israel, as well as the changing Arab perspective in the Middle East. Tonight, he shares with us that perspective and also the future of Arab-Israel relations as he sees it, his work on bringing the children of Abraham closer together, and of course, his riveting life story. Ladies and gentlemen, please, warm, warm, please join me rather in welcoming warmly our guest speaker tonight, live from the holy city of Jerusalem, where he joins us at, I think, the ungodly hour of 2 a.m., if I'm not mistaken. Welcome, Mark, and our deepest gratitude for you to meet us at this at this crazy hour. Yes, so Mark, I think you're muted, Mark. Can you unmute yourself? What, oh. what an introduction. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm so happy to be again in the company of uh, Chabad of West. Hear you? Um, my speaker. I think my volume is working. Let's check. Okay. Okay. Perfect. 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 Okay. Well, nice, uh, nice to see you, uh, Rabbi Rabbit Sinchanowitz. It's been some time. Yes. Um, a lot has I, happened. A lot has happened in your life, um, as well as ours, since you've last come to Montreal. And uh, Hashem. yes, you but are there now. Are things and experiences in life that you you never forget, and yes. uh, I very much enjoyed my stay in Montreal with you. Uh, the, the weather was very cold, but uh, the warmth of your community and your family, your small family, like you, uh, uh, I truly had a wonderful experience and that, that I would never forget. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having me over and thank you so much for this introduction. I don't think I deserve uh, this, uh, uh, this level, but uh, here I am. Um, well, you know, you Mark, you, Mark your, your life story is actually very exceptional and very inspiring. And I believe it lays the framework for the extraordinary things that you're doing today in Israel. So let's begin with your background. You were born in Kuwait as a Muslim to Muslim parents. And, uh, and you know, somehow along the way you discover that your grandmother is a Jew. Can you talk to us a little bit about your background before we get into your life today? Because I think it lays a framework to who you are today. Sure, Baruch Hashem, okay. Well, uh, um... I always struggle to introduce myself, but thank God now I'm married and my wife uh, helped me with, with, uh, with this uh, introduction issue. Um, I, I'd like to tell everybody, I, I was born and raised in Kuwait to a secular uh, Palestinian Muslim family. All along, we thought we're Palestinians and uh, my father was involved. So comes with that is the incitement and taking part of an incitement because you're a Palestinian. So uh, all along, I... Uh, 
hated the Jewish people, let's say, um, but at some point in my life, I know that my grandmother is Jewish, yet I never could have imagined that this one day will turn me into a Jewish person living in Israel. So this is where the, uh, the contrast is that people like, um, thank God, uh, how did this happen? Okay, I, I was born in Kuwait, like I mentioned, I grew up there, there's many variables. Back in the day, there was no uh, social media, there, there wasn't Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. So it's hard to get the information that we get today. Um, yet uh, years later, when I was uh, 21 years old, I was, I was uh, actually I was 23 years old, I was at university studying as a student at the University of Western Ontario. And that is in Canada, in a small town called London, Ontario, Canada. Um, one of those days and I'm studying in my, in the library, um, I came down and I bumped into this gentleman who looked Jewish. So I walked up to him and said, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? He looked at me smiling. He said, no, I just like to dress this way. Now, this was like one of my real interactions with a Jewish person, some, a, a religious Jew, somebody who identifies as a Jew, wears a, a kippah or a yarmulke. And uh, I would never forget also the fear, you know, we, we remember emotions. Um, I, I feared, I didn't know. I mean, I, I was told a lot of bad things about the Jewish people, unfortunately, but no, for, nobody has ever told me a Jew could be funny or humorous. So uh, I went back and forth with the conversation and the gentleman asked me, who am I talking to? Uh, I told him, listen, I, I didn't hate Jews 100%, only 95%, you know? My grandmother was Jewish after all. He heard my grandmother was Jewish and invited him to sit down and introduce himself. The gentleman said his name was Dr. Yitzchak Block. Um, and he said he's a retired professor of philosophy. Um, we exchanged a lot of you know, information. Mainly he was the one asking questions. And um, it was a racy meeting. Everything was happening really so quick. And in the middle of this, you know, I'm stressed trying to figure how I'm going to speak with this gentleman, what I'm going to tell him. Then in the middle of it all, he tells me, so by Jewish law, you're a Jew. Now, you know, I've seen movies where people discover, you know, he's the son of a different family or whatever the story is. Um, the surprise was grand and big. I don't want to focus on myself uh, particularly, but there's a lot of people in the Middle East today, youth, that share their stories of meeting a Jewish person for the first time. Um, whether it's in North America or Europe, wherever they go, whoever came to university in Canada or America as a student and uh, came across people. People usually like to tell me of their first interaction. And it reminds me again of my first interaction. It was just it was emotional, you know, I was not crying or anything, but it, it was very difficult because you get filled up with hate so much, then it just disappears with that beautiful attitude of that first Jewish person you, you've ever met. Gives you that time of day, listens to you, and talks back to you um, in a manner that, you know, is, it usually debunks a lot. So I tell all my friends and all my Jewish friends today, you know, when you meet a Middle Eastern person, know that you're an example, you're a model, and, uh, you know, just be yourself, be the, your beautiful self and, and how uh, your customs and religion demands of you. Um, Baruch Hashem, I was lucky to um, connect information from my family side and to stay in North America. There was a lot of pressure on me to go to Dubai back in the day because this is when, when things were first starting and jobs were offering a lot of uh, higher pay for those who have Canadian or American education. I truly wanted to go. At the same time, I was infatuated, not just in love, infatuated with Canadian, um, how could I say, you know, the way of life. You, I'm a Canadian citizen. Um, coming from the Middle East, no matter where you come from, great country or not, wealthy or not, it's just the social net, the, the government, the trust, the, you know, how nice the people are. Everybody comes from somewhere. Everybody's an immigrant like you in a way. Um, I wanted to stay in Canada. And I strived to that, and I was lucky again, Baruch Hashem, another connection was made, whether my intention or not, and I started a small business and I succeeded for a short period of time. From a thing that led to another, end up in Toronto, and I met a few rabbis along the way and ended up going to shul a few times. 
in the back of my mind, I always wanted to get married. So in order to get married, you know, I need to kind of uh, put myself together. I need some knowledge to tell my family, you know, just, uh, so I started seeking knowledge. And the situation allowed me uh, um, a few times to meet people who at university, at York University in Toronto, when there was a, a big anti-Israel and anti-actually Jewish um, attacks on students during the first war with Gaza, if you remember, it was really loud and there was the first coming of, of Al Jazeera. So I couldn't put up with that. I didn't know anybody at that university. I simply lived nearby. I took a day off from work and I took a big cardboard box and I wrote on it, free Palestinians from Hamas. At that point, all the knowledge that whether I had accumulated by myself or through my friends, the same um, type of truth seeking that millions, and I'm not exaggerating, millions of Arab speakers today are seeking through social media and through like simple personal interactions one-to-one. -one. And you're probably one of those people that, that you know, helps educate someone with a word or a sentence or a post. Um, so I went and I put the sign out there and all the anti-Israel guys came around me. They thought, you know, I'm Israeli. And they were like, you, you are a soldier, you baby killer, whatever. And I, I just didn't know how to prove myself. So I started screaming in Arabic and in English in order to verify. I said, am I the only Palestinian here? And I'm Palestinian Wahid home. In no time, literally everybody was around me. So I started talking and I explained the situation from how I chose to understand it. The terrorists are shooting and hiding behind families for many years, thousands of rockets. I'm talking high thousands, eight, 9,000 rockets were fired in two years. When Israel responded, all this hoopla went up. Um, and then they started talking about Hamas, but you know, it was hard to explain Hamas these days, but people, especially Arab speaking students came to me and said, thank you. We appreciate this. We have the same feelings. I asked them, why don't you talk? They said, because we live in certain areas where there would be pressure. Mm. So that's back in the day. This pressure, this social pressure is very important to understand in certain cultures. Mm. You bring shame to your family. You bring shame to your sister. She wouldn't get married. I don't know all that kind of talk. But there is substantial um, worry <laughs> that people have. And I understand it. And my, believe me, I got my fair share from my family. And I still do. But then Jewish students came on to me and started talking to me as well. And I got introduced to some people. And there was a trip being planned to Poland a leadership trip and to Israel and people invited me said, please come with us. I went, I went to Poland. I, I heard about the Holocaust recently, very recently, you know, within a year or two uh, of, of, you know, discovering Judaism. So, so but, Mark, you never heard of the Holocaust before that as a young person growing up? No, there's no Holocaust education in any of the Arab countries. As a matter of fact, um, that's during my time. Um, I, I'm sure things might have changed today and social media allows you access, but um, you, you are limited to the type of history education you were receiving back in the day. I didn't even learn about um, extensively about World War I and World War II. I heard of the, the names, but I didn't know that Germany were the good guys and England were the bad guys. I did not know. Maybe it was me. Um, I wanted to go. I wanted to go to Poland so bad. I went and visited Poland, afterwards Israel. That was in 2000 and, that was in 2009. I met Dr. Block in Canada in 2004. So it took me some years of just really building the, um, the, the guts to make that move. Uh, the, the opportunity came to be announced in front of me and I had to make a choice and I wanted to make a choice. I went to Israel, I visited Israel, fell in love. I look at everybody, they look like family to me. And most importantly, I went to Israel and I thought, even though I tried to defend as an amateur Israel on campus a few times and, and online and all, I thought Israel could have been an apartheid country. So when I went to Israel, I landed there at the airport and I saw people from all backgrounds Muslims and Jews and Christians and I don't know who, everybody, everybody, every race you could imagine are there together. I was just dumbfounded. I felt so stupid. I fell for this 
you know, misinformation campaigns that I was trying to defend. Um, I fell in love with it again more and more with Israel. And in the back of my mind, I thought I was a little sad. I went to the Kotel to pray and my mom told me, pray for God to send you a nice lady and all that stuff. And I was looking at almost all the ladies in the Israel. I was like, how am I going to get married one day? Who's going to marry me? What, what am I doing? And I decided I would love to learn a little bit about Judaism and just strengthen my knowledge in a way that would, I would allow me to, to have a foundation to build a family and things to speak about. Um, and it's, of course, this is important for anything, whether it's a diet or a religion or whatever you go through, you got to know what you're talking about. So I decided I want to go back to that beautiful place I just visited, Israel. Of course, every single day I wake up, whether it's Jerusalem, Eilat, the north, Tel Aviv, it's just a brain challenge. I'm trying to reorder the knowledge in my head. I'm trying to, sometimes I'm looking at people, they're so nice. And it just, we're told some of the worst things about Jewish diet, dietary laws. I'm learning about kashrut and how, you know, Jewish people are willing to go pay a rabbi to sit down at a restaurant to make sure you have no bugs in your vegetables. While in my education, I was told that Jews eat human beings. So it's just like, you go through these every day, you know, depending on the situation that you're in. Um, it wasn't so dramatic, but there's always a challenge. Thank God I was able to come to Israel a year later. It worked out somehow. It was similar times to these. It was actually October 5th uh, that I got a chance to go to Israel. It was October 5th, to th uh, year 2010, just before a parsha called Lech Lecha, which I didn't even know about. And I, and I heard of it. I, I went to a, a rabbi's house. I, I would love to mention him, uh, somebody I respect him. Uh, um, he lives in the old city. The names are flying out of my head right now, 2.30 in the morning. And uh, I, I sat in his room. He, he's a Chabad rabbi and uh, just um, a lovely uh, friend. And he started telling the stories about going back to your home, going back to who you belong, or like, you know, the, the, where Hashem promised you to be. And I just started like, you know, connecting myself with this. And, and this is what I, I call in my humble way of thinking, you know, the Jewish responsibility is just where you sometimes when history or our times demand, you have to stand up and act and, and make the solution or solve the issue. So I, um, I became like that a little bit. It's hard to explain this, I, I apologize. Um, well, I know, I know that you're very active in, on Facebook with social media engaging youth from the Arab world. Yes, and, and but I would like to ask you, how did you get involved with business with it at the, the UAE? How did that happen? So let me just explain the Facebook. Facebook was personal. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a Palestinian refugee, supposedly. Okay. I have a document in my bag that says I'm a Palestinian refugee. I've never been a refugee. My father is a very successful man, retired when he was 45. He made his our immigration to Montreal at the beginning when he was like in the early 40s and he was done, uh, so um, my sister, my brothers, everybody really, we all went to school in a way, some did better than the other, but um, we're not refugees. And I, I thought it's a scam, so I wanted to talk about it. And from here to there, I really pushed with this one and allowed me to go to the United Nations, talk about the, the UNRWA or UNRWA scam, where, where funds are raised in the name, in the numbers of certain people that are just automatically called refugees because my father was born in 1945 in something called British Mandate of Palestine, which gave him the, uh, the label. Um, so I wanted to disrupt this, or at least bring, you know, knowledge or PR about this, especially during the days that I was living in Israel where people were being stabbed in the street, stabbed in the street. And I know that these criminals were being paid high salaries, how, where, from, and uh, uh, a big chunk of this hundreds of millions of dollars that come a year, um, a, a, a month, sorry, not a year, uh, comes to the through the uh, UNRWA organization. But I, I noticed that you pointed out on you know I follow you on on social media that you pointed out that Rashida Talib, the U.S. Congresswoman, uh, whose parents immigrated to the U.S. before she was born in 1975, was born in in Detroit in 1976, earns $175,000 a year, but is still considered today a Palestinian refugee. And I guess that's what you're sure. speaking to. You say that your father, your father as well, did very well, and it doesn't matter. Nobody cares how much you make. 
They want to call here for refugee. They're just trying to build the, this whole idea for the numbers in order to get people to be registered. Um, we get $440 a month, each one of my family members. My mom has a different count. I don't know why, but my father, my sister, my four brothers and I. Um, now that's that's not peanuts. I'm sorry but like for, for the level of uh, how buying power in the Middle East, that's a lot of money really. And to be honest, if that money is given to a Syrian refugee family right now, sitting in the cold, believe me, they're still in the same spot and the winter is upon us. They're gonna be needing everything handed to them. I mean, give them money or give them some money. Like around $3,000 is what my family uh, receives a month. And I'm not gonna get stuck on this topic right now. Uh, the, the United Arab Emirates, my first interaction business was with the United Arab Emirates was in 2011, 2012. Now, a year after I arrived to Israel, I check out the news and the newly elected Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt decided to, to stop selling lulavs, lulavim, what we used to shake in, for Sukkot under the sukkah. Um, and people are panicking. And, and I'm in this, I'm programmed by now. My, my, I, my mind just does not want to allow bad to happen under my watch. <laughs> and I wanted to do something. So I went to the computer and I Googled, really, I didn't do any magic. Palm trees, they told me called fronds. Palm fronds, Jordan. I got a website called jordanpalm.com. It's probably over there already. I called the guy, Abu Ibrahim, made a deal. Next thing you know, went there, ex exchanged with him. Literally, I was just learning uh, about these topics, how to do business with him. Anyways, I went down there. We executed a deal. Within a few months, we were successful or done. Imported for the first time ever from Israel, from Jordan to Israel. And I loved it. So the next year, 2012, I went to Dubai. And I got even a bigger amount. And I spoke with many people. And it just struck me how people are open-minded in that side of the world. By the way, I, I do have family in the United Arab Emirates from the early 70s. Hmm. The country became a, a, a officially a United uh, Emirates in 1971. I have a few aunts with many children. These are from mom, mom's side. Um, we're also halakhically Jews, been living there forever. So my family goes back and forth. Anyway, I am there now as a Jew and some people who are friends of friends, but you know, they are you know, people that matter really, knew who I am and they were very hospitable and people were just very happy to have me over. And I felt good. I could take my tefillin with me and I don't have to hide it like in some other countries that I, I don't want to mention right now. So it's on Facebook Live. So, so just to be to recap, you said you go you go to the United Arab Emirates with your talis and your tefillin and you're you're feeling really welcomed and comfortable. It was Ramadan and I was wow. very uh, welcome. I arrived there. People didn't you know, say anything. People actually checked on me to call me. How are you? How's everything? Everything all right? And people told me about this beautiful law that they have in the country. Um, th there's an anti-discrimination law. It's a historic law that we don't know. You could Google it out there. It's maybe four to eight pages, well worth reading, nicely written. That um, if you just you cannot discriminate against anybody because of their creed, race, color, and religion. Just you cannot. And you could go to jail. And they, they have shown it. there are examples of people being called to. So. I started asking and questioning and meeting locals, especially those who allowed me to cut uh, lulavs from their farms. And people explained that throughout history, the United Arab Emirates people have been a connection. Um, we all heard about the Silk Route or Silk Road. The UAE is in the center of this. So the, these tribes of people, of Arabic people, have lived and seen and worked with people from various cultures and religions. They are open-minded little bit more than other tribes that live in the middle of the uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula and the desert. Um, and, and they're known for this. So it didn't come as a surprise. And you see people, you know, they, they're very secular and they're very religious. You see items for sale that could probably uh, be suitable for the Muslim diet. And it's some that is not. And I go somewhere else and I find, you know, various fresh fruits over there. And I start to learn about how I could uh, survive. Anyways, the whole the entire experience was great, and the idea of that law was great. Um, now I have friends that go back and forth, and I got to meet people who were impressed by this uh, particular deal. One of them was a diplomat, um, indirectly uh, unofficial, 
for Israel for the longest time. Um, it's called diplomat at large, ambassador at large. That means an ambassador that has various uh, countries under his. Um, he's a great guy, and he introduced me to a bunch of people. And next thing you know, I've been I was being called and asked to uh, you know chair meetings sometimes. Yalla, time to go to France, time to go to London, time to go to the United States um, or the United Arab Emirates. And that was so beautiful that way where people know who I'm speaking about. And then I started to learn about the amount of business that started when and the amount of uh, um, financial exchange between countries. And it was encouraging. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm simply... Everybody could do what I'm doing. Everybody that is listening here from Montreal. Anybody could do anything that I'm doing or others are doing. You don't need to know Arabic. People speak English over there and there's literally every opportunity. Why, why I liked helping and being involved. Uh, of course, I get paid for this as well as a job opportunity. I could say yes or no. Um, but at the same time, to bring the level of cooperation or level of interaction between countries to a certain level, it means that we are friends, we're, you know, we're doing things, we're interacting. And that was always in the back of my mind. I'm not an economist, far from it, never studied uh, economy, but just it, you could almost guess that there is goodness coming. Mm. I, the day of the announcement, I was in Tel Aviv, it was, was around my birthday time, and I took my family, we went to Tel Aviv to breathe a little bit. We know we're on and off here and on, on lockdowns. So, um, I received a call from somebody that I know who is um, he's from New York. He's been doing business there for like 32 years or so. He's like, Mark, I got a phone call from a senior friend you met before. I don't want to say names, he said. And he said to watch the news. Within the hour, there's a big announcement. And I knew it. I just literally knew it. That was 515 at 550, 550. The announcement was out. You could almost guess it. Just the same as you could almost guess that other countries are going to join soon. Um, the whole Palestinian uh, issue here that I'm going to just say this in literally two minutes, three minutes, because I think I'm digressing. Um, the, this whole Palestinian issue, what, what does it demand of you? It demands of you to give money, to blindly believe in their ideas, and also hear the nonsense they're going to be spewing to children and you the incitement, the, the, the violence, and some really horrible things that are being said about human beings. You know, the Jews are Jews are liars, Jews are thieves, Jews are not really human beings, There's Jews are not Jews even, you know, Jews in the Quran and the Torah, but the Jews today, no, that's a whole different people. Just the, the, the amount of ridiculous stuff is not only discouraging to those who, the youth, who could seek the truth on their own today just by opening Wikipedia or speaking with a colleague or a college person or a nice rabbi that he, they met in Montreal. No, the, these patterns of thought, like a certain prince last week said from Saudi Arabia, Prince Bandar, and I suggest everybody see that interview, um, they alter the way of thinking for their country people. You have, you have nations falling apart in the Middle East. You have so much violence. Some news would never get to the main news media in North America, but there are many crimes that just blow a person's mind. Where does that come from? When you keep teaching children horrible things, what do you expect of them to turn into saints and priests and rabbis? No. So they took a courageous step, these countries, and said, you know what, let's mix things up. Let's what, not let the bad why, leave. Why do you think specifically, you know, the UAE is a country that was first, given your knowledge of your business background, your dealings, I, I recently saw a, a reporting that was done on the fact that you were having your first phone call on a phone with someone in the UAE because before that you could not have a direct phone conversation. But what is it, do you think, that is on the ground? What is the makeup of the people there the fact that you've been there, done business, and really been at, at the nexus of this business aspect of UAU and Israel, what do you think makes them so receptive to move away from this idea that Israel has to somehow divide itself or Israel has to somehow give up things to make peace? What do you think is there, either in the culture or in the population, or is it just the timing that people have been, you know, have been waiting for 
you know, it's just the timing. What do you think it is that makes specifically these countries, specifically at these times, being so open to, uh, to this? Rabbi said, only God would know the, the answers for these questions. That's what I say, and I, I think you agree. Yet, if, if, if you are, let's, let's consider this a, a um, not family business, like a business, you know, in order to survive and plan for the next five years, you see what variables you have in the ground and you see what's good or bad for you. You know, the, the people have chosen the good over bad and it was the right time to just enough wasting our time. Israel, this is what people are saying, not me. People are saying, I used to say this, you know, two, three, four, five years ago for many, many years promoting Israel. But now people from the UAE day in and day out say this, Israel is an accomplishing country. Israel is a successful country. Israel is literally like proven to be one of the most powerful countries in the world. Why would I not put my hand in the hand of my neighbor across the, you know, a couple of countries and cooperate with each other, which would bring benefit to my people? that I invest a lot of, by the way, they invest a lot of effort in, the, in their citizens, in the United Arab Emirates. They don't spare, they don't spare anything. And, and, and this is what they want. Why would you keep people away from the good student and you follow the bully? No, they decided to just get the bully out of the way and just go to the source and just, um, I, I think it was a great decision on behalf of the leaders of the UAE, literally visionary, they, they, they just, um, mixed up the cards in such a way right now in the Middle East. The Middle East is not the same. The way people talk, youth talk, the voices, the supportive, the, how do they say this in America? The silent majority. Okay, we, we have a silent majority in the Middle East. Youth that just want to live, just want to succeed. Young girls, they want to dream. They want to become doctors. They want to become astronauts. They want to be like North American women, Israeli women, empowered. And same with the youth. It, it, the, 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 the iron gate was removed and people were allowed to just follow. Um, for, for, some people say, well, it's for security reasons. Yeah, sure, great. There are security uh, benefits out of this, but not just for security reasons. The benefit from social uh, interaction or social peace, which we have no history of quarrel or fight or bad blood, let's call it, or from wars and such between us and the Middle Eastern countries. And if you speak to any Gulf citizen, whether from Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, they know, they know. And the people always tell me this, Jews are the real cousins and we are the real cousins. I don't wanna say the, the continuation of the sentence, but I'll say it anyway, the other guys are not because they're not real Arabs. But why would we have a, a divorce of a family? This is just a family feud about something well, let's just fix it. Um, just to finish with one thing about the history, people say a lot of um, things about uh, you know the, their position here. And uh, my grandfather lived here. It's, it's a reality. You know, where did he come from before? I'm not sure. He worked for the Ottomans. They could have moved him from different places. There's a lot of families, Arabic families here. You walk down the street, you read Al Halabi, Al Humsi, Tarabulsi, the one from Tripoli, the one from Aleppo, the one from I don't know what. Your last name tells you where you're from. My, my mom's father, my grandfather, God bless his soul, Al-Masri from Egypt. My DNA test is all half Egyptian. Um, but what you're that, saying is that a lot of people who are Palestinians are really Egyptians, Libyans, or Syrians, or people coming from different countries? Uh, they were, came from different countries, you know, not too long ago, like, you know, within the last 50, 70, 80 years, 100 years. Um, at some point, they came over from different countries. Um, some must have been here, but just the truth is to be said, Jews have always dwelled in Israel. This is uh, something I liked at the end of the interview, the third part of the interview with Prince Bandar bin Sultan, when he said, you keep talking about history, he tells the Palestinians, he said, we know our history very well, and we know yours well as well. And uh, the lies are no longer a stick, the, you know, just uh, like we, in Hebrew, we say emet, emet is from three letters, each letter has two legs, you know, it stands firmly. Sheker, which is lies, the shin, the kuf, the resh, they have one leg. Sooner or later they'll fall. It took many years. Today, those who want to buy, boycott us, those who lead the boycott against the state of Israel for the many, many years, which is um, an organization called Muslim Brotherhood. They're, they're, they're just a cult of their own, led by, by Turkey, 
they are the ones being boycotted. There are massive, serious, or organic movements to boycott them. The bad guys are establishing wars. So everything is turning. Thank God, there is a God, and just everything is working in such a good way. Mark, I, I noticed that there's a lot of tourism that's being promoted now between between even the United States Jews and and the United Arab Emirates, and. Again, going back to this issue of why suddenly, do you think that this was really brewing, being that you have been involved in United Arab Emirates business for so many years, do you think this was brewing underneath the surface and really what has happened now with the peace deal is just a reflection of what is going on uh, inside as opposed to something that was imposed, which I find that let's say the oh. Oslo Accords were imposed, but do you find this is a reflection of the people as opposed to something that was top heavy? Because yes, for sure. Yes, for sure. You know, a sure warmth, what... like there, what struck me personally was there's a video image and, and photo image of these Israeli plane landing for the first time and all these Arab officials waving in their full uh, kafia, waving at the plane very warmly. And I found that to be very interesting and, and very different from the tense peace talks that really predicated and seemed to follow most of the peace talks that happened till now. Do you think Given your experience in the UAE, do you think that what we're seeing now is just an unveiling of what has really been happening beneath the surface in the Arab street? So look, I heard a lot of great things, but I wasn't keeping track of what everybody's ever done throughout the past many years that I have known or been involved in whatever work. Yet from friends who do know, they said it's just a matter of time because people have tested relationships, whether indirectly, whatever it is, they see where good is coming from, where opportunity is coming, you know, and who is, you know, the interruption of interrupter of this opportunity. Um, it was, I think, um, it was long in the works, I believe. And I think the, the anti-discrimination law that was issued um, was kind of a, one of the paving factors for this. People already were davening. I attended a bris 10 years ago, almost in, in Dubai. Seriously? People, with a Chabad rabbi from South Africa coming over wow. to do it. Thank God. Wow. And he brought his wife over too. And uh, so, uh, but, but it was it was almost coming, but he could never guess, which is just beautiful the way it is. Just re like that. Do you, do you account, I, I know that you've, you've said often that when you were a child, you had two TV channels that you could watch and it was, you know, it was, a mix of whatever was going on with a little bit of propaganda with was, was going on in Israel. Do you think the opening up the social media, the fact that people are on Twitter and that they're hearing voices that they otherwise would never hear? You know, we speak a lot about social media as being this very big monster, this negative monster, because unfortunately there has been, you know, there's a lot of vitriol that happens on social media. We know, you know, within within, you know, within the free countries, there's people get very, very testy with it. But do you think that this has played into an opening um, for the younger generation, at least, that there's a difference? Do you think, do you think social media plays a part in this? Absolutely. Yes, and absolutely. I remember the reason I went to speak to Dr. Block in 2004 was because the internet was just getting faster and faster was getting much faster in, in, in uh, we still had, uh, we had something called DSL or ADSL back in the day, but the Middle East, they, were, they continued to have dial-up and it was very expensive, but it was getting cheaper and faster, cheaper and faster every year. And you could almost guess that at some point it's gonna be available for everybody. And what I remember, the reason I, I had this idea in my mind and I wanted to speak to Dr. Block about it being as a Jew was that now we could take a picture of somebody or a video showing how, People in Canada from various backgrounds are sitting together, normally happily smiling in class, listening to the to the teacher and sharing their notes with each other. And nobody's looking at the other and saying, hey, you're, you're different, you look different, you're Indian, you're Jewish, you're Muslim, Pakistani. That, that really struck me. It's not that the, the Middle East is just people are fighting with each other, but there were different classes and different categorization. And you didn't see all these beautiful people from various backgrounds. And definitely not seeing a Jew and a, and a Muslim sit next to each other in class, which I see all the time. So I just, I thought perhaps um, I would share, or like I told Dr. Black, I would like to export Canadian values to the world, to the Middle East, and show them that, you know, maybe they'll bring peace, it will calm people down to see how women walk with honor and work in various, uh, you know, 
and nobody attacks her for not having a, a, a hijab or would go into university. Some areas you cannot go to university if you're a female. So, so I was very powerful. Was, and it had a small vision, a small dream. Slowly, slowly, sometimes, you know, faster than I would imagine, it came to the degree that I see how many Arab youth are listening to, for example, um, Israel, Israel's foreign affairs um, has an account that promotes certain parts about Israel, about the culture, about the technology, socially. People say Israel does a bad job. I think they do a fantastic job, especially in the, in the Arabic department. I do not work for them, everybody. Nobody pays me. They just do a superb job. I think so. And people are watching. People are watching and seeing. When there's a war, Israelis are treating the children coming over from war. Palestinians, th this gentleman right now who was admitted today, he's a chief negotiator, was admitted to the hospital today. Big Palestinian guy, one of the leaders of BDS, tells people to boycott Israel. And for the third time, he comes into a hospital. Uh, God bless him. I hope he survives Corona. And I, I wish him, you know, refuah shlema like I wish everybody. But the gentleman is not a nice guy. Yet, I wasn't the only person to see it. All of you, maybe half of you have seen this news today. It's all over the news. And people deduce or deduct what they want from this. Arabs, just open Twitter and look what the Arabs are saying in Arabic. They say, okay, they, we were told Israelis are horrible, monsters eating whatever, by this Palestinian leader and his folks. And we should boycott them. And he's, he cannot be treated because they do not build hospitals. They steal the money. And now they go to be treated in Israel. Yet, normal Palestinians aren't allowed to seek uh, um, medical help in Israel, by the way. If they would, they would come and Israel would receive them, but a lot of them are not uh, allowed. So uh, people are aware and awake and have minds and eyes and ears and they could see it all. Today, the United Arab Emirates decided we're not going to hate, we're going to extend an arm, and we're going to try to do business back and forth and education back and forth and hopefully take the best you know, from, from each other's cultures and benefit each other's culture. That's this amazing. Enough enough. And this, by the way, this, by the way, is very good for the Palestinians and very good for Jordanians and um, of Palestinian background or Jordanians themselves. The whole area will just get a little jolt. I mean, if anything, the UAE should be praised. Israel should be praised for this. American leadership right now, really, this is just magic and amazing. Maybe maybe they didn't do enough Hollywood style hoopla about it because of Corona times, but it was just perfection. Speaking of this, Hollywood, I are, yeah. Speaking of Hollywood, when is the movie about your life coming out? That's Robert said, if you make a connection with a, with, a, with a director, I'll be right there. Yeah, because I think you're you know obviously we didn't have time to get into your full story, but it really is very poignant, sorry, very moving. Sorry. We have some questions. Can we take can we take some questions? Please, please, yeah. Bakasha, I'm here and I'm, okay. I'm not on. Okay, so uh, someone's asking the question. What do you, what what caused you to open up a conversation with a Jewish looking person, a rabbi, in the first place, given that you dislike Jews? And also, what is the attitude of your parents towards your conversion to Judaism? Okay, the, uh, all right, good questions. The the dislike part. I mean, I came to Canada. I've been here for some time, and I, I, we're really not um, not into religion. That I, I was I was. Um, I don't look at things from a religious point of view. My father has really kept us away from religion. So I just really um, got out of my head and started looking at people for who they are in, in North America. And the reason I walked to Dr. Block is I wanted to create a non-for-profit in Canada as a way of creating something for myself, of work to do, benefit the world, and also maybe do work for myself. I, I didn't succeed. I didn't do it. I didn't try because I didn't know how to do that. And I needed, you know, I needed to stay in Canada instead of going to the Middle East. My mom was, had plans, that's it, I'm gonna find you a woman, you're gonna get this, get your job, it'll be fantastic. So uh, thank God I did a few things, but it always got stuck in my mind to, to, to so, but I went to Dr. Black to tell him about this idea of mine. Peace, salam, shalom. I told him I wanna export Canadian values. What did my parents uh, think of the attitude? My parents went through all the like variations on the colors and the shades of anger and doubt and thinking I'm crazy and he'll get gonna get better tomorrow. Um, thank God I, I, I uh, continue to try to open channels of communication with my siblings. I have respect to all of them. I love my parents. 
Unfortunately, the relationships are not very well, not too strong. And I'm hoping the next coming period, um, half of the families in the United Arab Emirates, and I will see them. So I'm hoping for the next coming period, we'll have money meetings that would uh, perhaps cement uh, the relationship again. Um, what do you think the key ingredient might be, another question, to help sway the Palestinians to really make peace? So change their leadership. I think that the leadership is just so bad and rotten. The, 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 um, the, uh, this particular prince, <clears throat> uh, the Saudi prince, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, who gave that lovely interview just two weeks ago, um, outlined, outlined it all. I'm just gonna quote him. He said they're cheaters, liars, backstabbers, all that stuff. So, so people know about the, the certain attitudes of those leadership if you want to call them leadership. I mean, a, a gang has a leadership too, and a mafia has a leadership, those guys. Um, so right now, the, the attitude and understanding is something that is very, very loud and public, and everybody's heard it loud and clear, is that the leadership of this business called the Palestinian Authority is corrupt and rotten to the core, cannot be reformed, and it's got to go. And the Palestinians, people are willing to help those people. The people willing to help you build yourselves again, hopefully through a framework that would be announced at some point in the near future. But I think something is gonna come up in that department. Another question, um, did you undergo a halacha conversion? Because, and, and, did you, and did you get married? <laughs> so. Okay, when I was uh, around the York University time, I met with this lovely rabbi, his name is Rabbi Vidal Beckerman. He's a good friend, he's a nice guy. I owe him a call actually, I need to call a lot of people. Um, um, we spoke a lot and under, uh, through him, I, I asked about these matters and he put me in touch with, with, with the Bay team in Toronto. And I went and spoke with the rabbis and it was a frank, open talk. And um, usually I would not jump for things uh, back in the day, you know, with a motivation being just only um, you know, to, to benefit me. Like, but, but when it came to the marriage part, I really just thought to myself, I want to get married, really. So, so the rabbi said, listen, you are a Jew, like all of us, but you need to fix yourself a little bit more. And there is a halacha that you, you, have, you have to uh, um, build up your knowledge and you have to do a, um, a, a formal conversion, different type of conversion, but it's conversion nevertheless. You have to build your knowledge. And uh, you could do it here, you could do it in Brooklyn, or you could go to Yerushalayim if you want to, to Israel to learn. I heard Israel and I just came from Israel. I said, I'll go to Israel, no problem. So uh, I decided then to go and study and thank God instead of eight months, it became four years. And, but it was, uh, it was good, it was much, much needed. In the business that I'm in right now, I'm in the food business. I learned a lot, Baruch Hashem, and I'm, I'm learning every day. I had to use the last few hours to, to up my knowledge a little bit. Um, the, 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 I don't want to sound like a rabbi, but, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Um, the, the Torah is a, is a tree of life, really, and, and we could grasp on it um, and, and learn and flow with a learning, and we, we will find ourselves. Everybody will find where he stands naturally. For a Jew, it's going to come natural. And it, naturally, for me, Hashem, I was led to certain things of my interest, and uh, not only that built knowledge, but also bridged knowledge by previous other stuff that I learned. So I got into the kosher and halal world. And I, I'm a conduit between uh, companies sometimes, whoever has kosher, help them get halal. And there, there's, a, there's a, thank God, a, a very good uh, amount of people that I deal with sometimes in the United Arab Emirates that, that deal with what I do. And people that wear the full air dress that uh, have learned a few things about the uh, halachot of kashrut because of me. Thank God things happen for a reason. We don't know sometimes uh, what uh, a, a, a certain direction is gonna be in our lives. Um, and we think this is it, it's the end of the world. But uh, when we go through this uh, impediment sometimes or this, this stoppage and we look at ourselves five years later, we, we knew why we had the, um, so just to make the right decision sometimes, no matter the cost, it will pay off, that's all. That's very inspiring and, and you know, as we close, we're living through a very difficult period. You know, so many of us have to deal with this, you know, all over the world, we're dealing with Corona. People are down. It's taking much longer than people expected. This separation that we have to have, this kind of lockdown and opening up and lockdown, it's, 
I think people are feeling down. And yet here's a story that is happening as we speak, like I mentioned earlier today in Bahrain. There's, there's a lot of good things happening and you're on the ground there, you're doing business, you're flying back and forth. Tell us from your perspective, what you see for the future in the Middle East, for Israel in the Middle East, for, for the world peace and, and, and all these countries coming together and, and kind of finding common ground. Um, I see prosperity. I see more choices and chances for people in the Middle East to evolve, the nations to evolve together. Um, there's a lot of benefit for obviously the Middle Eastern people and for the state of Israel, for, for, for uh, citizens of Israel. Um, at the same time, it's just to think 10 years from now, I, I think the Middle East would take, you know, Europe or, or North America in the, if things work well for the next many years uh, in the success of, uh, you know, in general. Let me just put myself here in the main so I could see something, sorry. Yes. Um, yes. I, I can't read the future. I can't read the future, but I saw the, the literally two hours ago. It was the end of the night, Sunday night, uh, in uh, uh, Middle Eastern time here, where they showed pictures from Manama. Uh, Manama is a um, the, the, the kingdom of Bahrain is known for for uh, coexistence and people living together for many many years. They have people from various backgrounds and religions and sects living in peace in that small tiny place. I got the pleasure to meet um, uh, an ambassador, um, a, a Bahraini Jewish ambassador of Bahrain to the United States, to uh, Washington. Her name is Huda Nunu. We, we had a, a couple of chats together. This reflects really how the country is committed to allowing or working with people from various backgrounds and building their, their, their society as a, as a you know, multi-ethnic society, which brings strength um, so just now that's the social part. Now this will increase. This will also affect UAE. Saudi Arabia is watching closely. Kuwait is watching closely. I think personally Saudi Arabia is going to be the second country or third country to come forth or at least in the next uh, near foreseeable future. Why? The benefits are very good socially. Now we want to talk economically. God only knows. But there's, a, there's know how and there are resources and there are other resources as well. There's every single reason to build a strong neighborhood here in the Middle East, not only to benefit the people, but also to, to dissuade enemies from even thinking about harming any of the states around here. Uh, people had enough. Everybody wants to feed their children. Everybody wants to send their kids to good universities and schools. Everybody wants security. Social security, food security, you know, primary security, um, and this really we just we're closer to this more than ever thanks to the recent uh, events. That's wonderful. And one last one last question: Where did you meet your wife? And I know uh, I know that you have a, a beautiful wife and two beautiful children. So let's end off with a little salute to your wife and the new family that you've created in Israel. This really a melding of different backgrounds and and re, and you know living really a biblical a biblical inspired story in a certain sense is, is coming back to your roots uh, the meeting was uh wasn't really planned but through friends friends introduced us um we we had an interaction and i heard about her family and where they came from they also have a story they came from finland so we had something to talk about um, I heard her speak with her friends about business. She went to business school and this. She was speaking about good things. So that attracted me to her. But at the same time, I was, um, I, I didn't have uh, so much self-confidence. Oh, who's going to marry me? And who's going to allow his daughter to marry this guy with, with this story? So I had doubt. But uh, I invited her to um, a Shabbat dinner that I was going to where I was to share my story. I wanted her to hear. So she came over. Then she went and told her family. And the meeting afterwards was with her father. And wow. we, yeah, we met each other and we got to know each other. And they were a very lovely and warm family that accepted me and brought me over for Shabbat Torah. We got to know each other. It was very nice the way it was. And uh, somehow things worked. My confidence came up again. And this is, was just about the time when I, uh, no, that was before the uh, United Arab Emirates work. I was just doing some stuff with, uh, ministers 
from Oman um, took them to one minister and his assistants that took them to Norway, to the old capital of Norway, Trondheim, for business. And she heard about these things and she encouraged me. She said she liked that. So I was happy that, you know, I found someone with common interests or sees value or potential in, in my uh, experiments. So we liked each other more and thank God one day just I'm looking around me, she's walking around me in circles under a chuppah and everybody that came across my life for many years from various countries were right in front of me, including from Dubai, including from Abu Dhabi, including from other places and uh, just, uh, I got married. And uh, Hashem blessed us with a child a year after, which was really my dream is to continue where my grandmother started. I wanted to have Jewish children. Um, and I just got blessed with a child and then she changed our lives forever. And then a few years later, we got another one. And here we are just hustling at home with a couple of nice girls and my wife and trying to uh, you know, keep our, uh, our chin up, like we say, in these difficult times, as you mentioned, Robinson. These times might be difficult, but uh, just to focus on the now and what we are doing right now, focus on the present and uh, make goals for ourselves. Please God, all of us will have wonderful uh, things to do and celebrate and uh, you know, catch up with after this whole uh, dark pandemic area passes. Well, thank you very much, you know, Mark, and thank you for your time. It is now, I think, close to four o'clock in the morning in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. So really right. coming on, that was very generous of you, very, very kind, and it was informative, it was inspiring. And we look forward to being in touch with you. Continue the good work that you're doing um, in the UAE and in the Arab world to bring together the, the you know uh, you know the sons of Abraham. And hopefully, we'll live very soon to the day that we see that the you know the, what our prophets prophesied and promised us that one day we will all live in 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 one in one shem echad. We will be one one uh, one people worshiping one God in unity and peace and happiness and health. And may it come very soon in our day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you very, you. very much. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody. Thank you, Rob Shanowitz. I really appreciate this. I can't wait to catch up with everybody in person. Please, God, after this whole thing, and Blee I would love to bring my family to enjoy the beautiful community that you have. Amen. To the Daraba in Hebrew, in Arabic, and in every language for truly inspiring all of us here. And Mark, uh, it's long overdue. Hope that do we see each other next time in person in Yerushalayim and uh, in Montreal. And in Montreal. Uh, when, when you come back to Montreal, when you bring back, we'll make sure that's not going to be in the in the winter, in the cold winter, but uh, when it's going to be fine. Uh, okay, take care. Go Thank through. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Chodesh Tov, everyone. Be well.